Okay, so everybody has skin, but how much skin do you have on your body? Well, the, you may have heard that the skin is the largest organ on your body. And yes, your skin is an organ. It has many tissues and it carries out a specific or specific functions. Now, it's more than a covering. So here's like my old couch and here's the old previous. If you have the Martini version of textbook, this is my couch for reference. And my old couch was about one meter by two meters. So on an average adult person, you have about two square meters of skin. So if you took all the skin off somebody and put it on a couch, that's kind of like one of those like how silence of the lamp sort of things. But again, this is like two square meters. So that's how much skin you have covering the surfaces of your body. And this is back in the day. So this is me when I was a lot lighter, <laughs> but back then I weighed 150 pounds. And this is my, yeah, this is our family dog, Alika. He's he's not the, waiting at the Rainbow Bridge, but he was a good boy. But he weighed 24 pounds. And yes, he is, like, long story, like, my parents got him for, like, inherited him from another auntie. But yeah, he weighed 24 pounds. He was a big boy. So he weighed about, so if you took all my skin and then put it on, it, that it would weigh about the same as Alika did. So about 24 pounds. Okay, so fish superficial versus deep. So again, this is the these are the anatomical directions that weren't quite explicitly pictured in the previous pictures in your textbook, and both the Martini and the OpenStax they don't really have this picture. But again, superficial and deep is kind of like saying toward the surface or away from the surface. So superficial doesn't matter which direction, as long as you're going toward the outer surface of something, it's superficial and deep and sometimes called profound is the other direction so it doesn't matter where you're going as long as it's toward the surface it's superficial all right so let's talk about skin structure so you might have heard like people oh, okay they're so superficial they're only concerned with outward appearances well they're talking about outward appearances right so they're talking about the outer layers of the skin they're only as concerned about what's out and presenting to everybody else so the outermost layer Whereas if you have a deep connection with someone, well, it's probably more than just about their appearance. You connect on them with not only just like just general attractiveness, but you're also connected to them emotionally. So deep is referring to the opposite. So what we have here are three basic regions of the skin. So the outermost and most superficial region of the skin is the epidermis. And what we have here is the epithelium. And then the dermis is actually a dense irregular connective tissue. So this is why, if you don't know what that is, you might want to retread on our previous lecture. So what it is is like dense. It has more collagen or more protein fibers than so that fluid ground substance, and it also has irregular. That means not all the fibers are arranged in the same direction. They're kind of going multiple directions and crisscrossing and weaving in and out of each other. And then the, you have the hypodermis. And why do I highlight this? Well, look at this epi. Remember, epi means outer. So the epidermis is outer to and superficial to the dermis, whereas hypo means under, right? Like hypochondriac and hypogastric. So the hypodermis is below the dermis and deep to the dermis. And this is loose connective tissue. And if you look here, you have this yellow tissue. That's the white adipose, and it's yellow because of all that triglycerides, fats, and lipids. Okay, so we're going to work our way from superficial to deep for this chapter. So we're going to start off with the epidermis, which is an epithelium. Okay, so or actually, let's rewind a bit. So you may have also come across this in the tissues chapter. So membrane is one of those words that appear multiple times, and they mean different things depending on context. In this case, when you have a epithelium plus a connective tissue, you can form a larger structure called a membrane. And in the case of the epidermis and dermis, they form a larger membrane called the cutaneous membrane. So that's what they mean that the combination of both the uh, epithelium and epidermis and the connective tissue dermis. And this is also known as your integument. So this is why it's called the integumentary system. Now, is your integumentary system just your skin? Well, the skin is the largest part of it, but it also includes accessories such as the hairs, the nails, and the glands. So it's not just about the skin, even though the skin is the majority of the bulk of your integumentary system. Yeah, so sometimes this is your skin. 
All right, so what is the epidermis made out of? Well, it is an epithelium, but what type of epithelium? Hmm, you might remember like epithelia, they are a layer of cells, but they have shapes and they have layer or layers. So what we have here is a basement membrane that anchors it all, because remember, it's something needs to attach and provide a surface for these epithelial cells to grow on. And what we have going from the outside toward the inside, so again, it's going from superficial to deep, we have what we call strata. So strata refers to a layer, it's Latin. So we have the stratum corneum, we have the stratum lucidum in some types of skin, and then stratum granulosum, then stratum spinosum, and stratum basal, sometimes called the germinativum. So it's one of those things where there's multiple terms for the same thing, so usually I do I want you to know, like, okay, like, am I going to just use one preferentially? I think it's worth knowing both synonyms because especially if you look at other articles that do other classes where one uses basal, one uses germinativum, well, that way you don't have, like, a, when you actually encounter something you already know, you just don't know the name for it, you won't be at a loss for knowing what it is. Okay. So what we have here, so going from superficial to deep, we have the corneum, lucidum, granulosum, spinosum, and basal. So I've heard many mnemonics and whatnot. So what I like this one is like, I've heard like, come on, let's get sunburn. Or I heard another one like Cetaphil leaves glowing skin behind or Clinique leaves glowing skin behind. Um, I like this one. So if you're like, a, well, I would, I would say I'm a former, <laughs> former gym bunny, but I'd like to say, okay, what day is it? It's Friday, right? So another great mnemonic I like is like, come on, let's go squat bra. So it tells you what the layers are in order, and it also tells you the first layer, first letter. Because I hate the mnemonics where they don't have order, but I love all those mnemonics. Whatever mnemonic fits it, I don't want you to say, oh, this mnemonic is better than other. If it sticks in your head and it's pretty accurate, I'm all for it. Okay, so what we have here. So why is the stratum basal? That is the germinativum, and germinate sounds like generate, right? So this is where you generate new cells in your epidermis. So this is where all the stem cells of your epidermis are. So these stratum basal cells, they undergo mitosis, and re they regenerate and regenerate. But as they start to divide, they also start to push up other layers as well. So there's no once this entire basement membrane is occupied, older cells are starting to be pushed out further and further. So as they get pushed further from the basement membrane, they start to form the other layers that are more and more superficial. So again, the stratum basal is called the germinativum because it divides and undergoes mitosis. But as these cells get pushed due to the continuous mitosis and cell division down here, that's when we get these layers pushing up. And as they push up, they start to take on different properties. So then from spinosum, it becomes the granulosum, then the lucidum, and then the corneum. So this is the part you can see right now. You can look at your own skin, and the part you're looking at right now is your stratum corneum. So stratum corneum, this is the outermost layer, and it's also the layer that peels off. So even if you just do regular daily activities, you're always constantly shedding some skin from your or these outer layer of cells from your stratum corneum. That's why it's very important to have those stratum basal cells constantly dividing so that it ha generates more layers of cells so that your skin doesn't peel off until there's nothing but raw flesh underneath. So this is the way the growth goes. It goes from deep to superficial. Even though the mnemonic went from superficial to deep, in terms of growth of these cells, this is how it is. So again, with another thing with the mnemonic, um, one thing to watch out for is sometimes people, you have to know which way the mnemonic goes if it has an order. So for those previous mnemonics, they're going from superficial to deep. But when you talk about how the cells actually grow, they actually go from deep and push out toward the superficial. And this is like, also remember that apical and basal. So basal is at the basement membrane. So what we have is growth toward the apical side of all of these cells over here. All right, so what did I say that most of these layers have um, five layers? And the thing is that we have thick skin and thin skin. So everyone has thick skin, everyone has thin skin. But where do you find thick skin? Well, you find thick skin where you often touch things or place a lot of weight throughout the day. So what part of your body, are you, when you're walking around during the day, what part of the body is touching the ground or the inside of your shoes? 
it would be the soles of your feet, right? So it kind of makes sense to have thicker skin on the soles of your feet because you're applying all this pressure. Or if you're one of those people who can like have really, really like they're, you be, you're a beach bum and you go to the beach every day, you can walk on lava rock, no problem. You want a lot of protection on the soles of your feet. But what else do you touch to? What part of your skin do you touch to other surfaces all the day? Your hands, right? So your keyboard, your phone, your doorknobs, everything. So this is where you also have thick skin. So you have a thick skin on the palms of your hand and also your feet, soles of your feet. Now the thing about this is that thick skin has all five layers, but pretty much everywhere that's not your palms and not the sole of your feet, it is thin skin. So thin skin doesn't have this dram lucidum. Now, do I want you to know the general shapes and properties? Well, in very general, I'm not going to say like, okay, I'm not going to show you a, a sample of a cell and say by itself and say, which layer is this? I think that's too advanced for this at this level. And what's the difference between a granulosum and spinosum cell? Or what's the difference between a corneum and a lucidum well there are general properties like the lucidum is called lucidum because it's lucid and kind of clear and jelly like when you look at a histology slide but i think that's kind of advanced for now you definitely should know the strata of the epidermis in order going from superficial and de to deep and vice versa and you should also know which layer is the outermost which one peels off hint it's the one that's exposed all the time and you should know which layer is the part that regenerates the most of uh, the cells and pushes the other layers up. So you should know which one. So that's the difference between thick and thin skin. So thin skin, four layers, thick skin, five layers. So it's kind of like a four layer versus five layer burrito. One is thinner, one is thicker. And again, thin, if it's not the thick, it's, or thin skin, if it's not the palms of your hand or the soles of your feet, it's thin skin. All right, so another general property. So I want you to focus more on, instead of working, like looking at the individual cells of each layer, general properties between and differences between each layer. So what we have here is another protein called keratin. And what is keratin? Well, it's a protein and it's also hydrophobic. And what it does is form, here we have one single polypeptide of keratin. And it forms these little wraps around each other and starts to form these longer cables. So these form these keratin filaments. And the cool thing is that why do I make a big deal about hydrophobic? Because remember, hydrophobic means that a chemical does not like associating with water. So it's going to repel water. So keratin is found in your skin. And this is why when you drop a bead of water on your skin, it tends to it doesn't immediately get soaked up like a sponge. So your keratin, now I think I have to check the most recent open stacks, but what I often hear is like, this makes your skin hydrophobic and makes it waterproof. Well, I think like to think of it to say, well, what if you soak in the tub for a long time? Are you going to have none, none of that water soaking into your skin or your other tissues as well? No, you actually get some water creeping in there and into the cells. So it's not completely waterproof. I like this term water resistant. So keratin, even though itself is hydrophobic, it doesn't make your skin completely waterproof. It does make it more on the hydrophobic side, but I like that term water resistant versus waterproof to describe your skin. But things like your nails, your nails are made of keratin too. Now, if you soak your nails in water, does it stay the same, like, same texture and density? Well, you notice that maybe your nails get a little softer when you soak it in water. So even though your nails won't dissolve like sugar in water, that would be really freaky if it did, it's still more waterproof. It's not, you can leave the nail in water, it's not going to dissolve like salt or sugar. So again, keratin is hydrophobic, but doesn't make the integument and its accessories completely waterproof like we associated with other waterproof surfaces like a tent tarp or something. So where you also find keratin? Your hair, right? So another example of why it's not exactly completely waterproof when you have these integument and structures. You can soak your hair and I mean, I don't have hair right now, but when I had hair, you can tell when your hair is wet and your hair is dry and there's different pliability and properties, right? So if you soak your hair, maybe see like you get easier to style and when it's dry, it's harder to do that. So your hair does repel water, but it does absorb some. So again, keratin is important. It's hydrophobic, but it's not completely waterproof. I mean, it doesn't make a 
structure completely waterproof. Oh, another example, if you like animals, keratin like horns. So the same thing, that's why it's like the horns of an antler of a, was a moose or deer. That's the same thing, or even like there are horns on rhino horns. I mean, it's so stupid that the people, I mean, I'm sorry if that's part of your traditional medicine, but it's freaking keratin. And it's like, it's like they're, they're killing these poor rhinos for their, their horns, which are just keratin. It's like, why not get keratin? Why not just grind up fingernails instead instead of killing these endangered animals? But, oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> a little rant there, but yeah, that's like, uh, yeah, keratin is pretty much your nails and hooves and whatnot. So it's like, it's just a protein. But yeah, poor rhinos. Okay, so what we have here is the basal and this generating all the other layers. And what happens as you generate all these new layers is that you start to form these keratin granules. So you have these little pocket bunches of keratin, but what happens as these layers get pushed out is that these granules get bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, as they get go toward the five layers or four layers in thin skin, then it goes to the corneum, and this is why the outermost layer of your skin is high water resistant, and why you can th put a bead of water on your on your skin and see, and then wipe it off and have it roll off. So what happens at this point? It starts to form these long filaments, and that's this is why the outer layer of your skin is mostly hydrophobic. The cool thing is it also and lets just like those. I mean, it's not going to be strong as like an antler or horn. But this does provide some mechanical protection as well. So it might not be completely as solid as your nails, but it is a layer compared to your typical squishy soft cells that on the inner side of your skin, these cells of your stratum corneum are going to be a lot more durable. And this is why it's kind of like your own like scales or plate of armor. And hey, what type of shape is this? Remember, this is an epithelium. And when we look at an epithelial cell shape, well, we know it's definitely stratified, right? Because that has multiple layers, it has multiple strata. But when we look at an epithelium, we look at the outermost layer, right? So when we look at this, the outermost layer, the most superficial, it's that flat, scaly, squamous flat cell. So this is why the epithelium, the epidermis, is a, a stratified squamous epithelium. And this process over here we saw here is keratinization. Now, do you need to know exact amounts of keratinization? Just know that as you push from deep to superficial, this your cells start to gather more and more keratin. So the cool thing is that, like the, but the trade-off is that when you have this hydrophobic protein building up in these cells, the cells actually start dying as well. So they lose their nuclei as they transition from here to here. But at this point, they're so full of keratin, they're not functioning. They're dead. So this is why when you shed, shed these, or if you use one of those scrubby towels, like those Korean or Japanese scrubby towels, this is why you might feel something, but it's not going to be like, oh my god, I'm like, like when you get road rash, like you're skateboarding and you eat it and you tear off all that skin. Yeah, that's why if you just exfoliate, it doesn't hurt because those cells are already dead. There's no nerve endings there either. Okay, so... What we have here, uh, we have the United Nations and all of these different skin tones. So what causes skin color? Yeah, so here we have melanocytes and what we have is like, yeah, I agree, Matt. Yeah, it's like, and funny thing is like, there's so much other things in TCM and all the like Korean and East Asian medicine. Like, I think even the Japanese one, like they move away from animal products. But yeah, it's like they have all these other cool things with all these other compounds, but yeah. Okay, so melanocytes. So let's talk about melanocytes. These make that throwback to the connective tissue proper. So these are the ones that make melanin. And there are different types of melanin. Do you need to know the exact chemical structure? Well, eumelanin, pheomelanin, they're all in this category. So there's not just one melanin, there's different types of colors. And this is why we have different skin tones. We have all make different patterns and different levels of melanin. Now, where do we make melanin, or where do you find these melanocytes? Well, melanocytes are interesting because they're actually hanging out toward the basal and at the basement membrane that is the border between the stratum basal and the connective tissue underneath. So these melanocytes, they actually extend throughout the stratum basal and into, somewhat into the stratum spinosum, and they generate that chemical category called melanin. So depending on melanin, it could be brown, dark brown, it could be black, it could be reddish. But what it does is generate this pigment, this color, just like a pigment in a paint, 
this has color and the more of this melanin you have the more color you have of whatever type of melanin you're producing now skin pigmentation so what's the difference between these two people so what we have here is that if your cells produce your melanocytes only produce a little melanin well you're going to have some color to your skin but what about someone who produces a lot of melanin well they're going to have a darker skin tone because melanin is that dark um, reddish brown pigment okay so let's do our first <laughs> let's do a little break so let's talk about our first top hat question and let's open up our browser so speaking of melanin so people with albinism do not have melanocytes true or false sometimes these people might call them albinos but yeah I think they say people with albinism Ooh, and tattoos. If I have time, I like to talk about tattoos, but yeah, I, Natalie, or we shouldn't say that, because like, it's like burp on whatnot, but she's right. It is in the dermal layer, so you have to actually go a little deep because then it also involves macrophages. So macrophages, they're the ones that take up the tattoo ink and they stay in place, so they hold that tattoo in place so like if you have a tattoo you know how good it looks in the beginning it looks super dark and then it fades over time well the bad thing is that sometimes those that not all that tattoo ink is taken up by your cells or it ends up just being flushed out from your body but what's left over are the cells those macrophages that did gobble up the ink and stay in place so that's why it's like oh my tattoo looks really great and then you said oh it's got kind of faded in parts Oh, but back to the question. Okay, so a little de deviation. All right, so people with albinism do not have melanocytes. So most of you say that, true, they do not have melanocytes and that, or no, wait, so 34 per said true that they do not have melanocytes, 61 said they, false, they do have melanocytes. Well, let's find out the answer to that question. Okay, so what we have are all these different skin tones, right? But the interesting thing is that we have pretty much almost anywhere, regardless of ancestry, we have instances of people with albinism. So what we have, I know it's like cool, it's like people of African ancestry or even like, I think this is New Guinea, but, and this is an Asian person with albinism. So, and this, what we have here was Sherry Lindsay. This was her with makeup, but she actually has a condition called vitiligo. And what happens in that is that she has something happening to her melanocytes. But vitiligo is different from albinism. Don't get those two confused. But they do both involve melanocytes. Now, what happens to melanocytes in terms of albinism? Well, the thing is that with these people who have albinism, they do have melanocytes. But the interesting thing is that their melanocytes just don't produce melanin. So if you looked at a cross section of their skin and looked at the melanocytes there, you would see that you would have the outline of them, but they wouldn't have that dark color pigment because they, their melanocytes don't have the ability to synthesize and make melanin chemical molecules. Now with Sherry Lindsay in the previous slide, what happens is that vitiligo is an autoimmune condition. Autoimmune means your own immune system attacks your own cells. So what if your immune system attacks your melanocytes? Well, if your immune system attacks your melanocytes, your melanocytes die. If you don't have melanocytes, can you produce melanin? So that's why she has pockets of that skin that doesn't have um, pigment because she doesn't have melanocytes compared to the people who have albinism who probably do have melanocytes that just don't produce melanin. But this is why mel melanocytes are super important. White tigers are lacking melanin. You know, you should call dibs in on that. So I, we don't get to cover animal physiology much, but I think that sounds like a great pack back question. So yeah, like uh, like there's other like pigmentation in other animals. I think that's a really cool, uh, cool topic. 
So again, so we all were in Hawaii, right? So a lot of people come here, especially if they come from like a place with not much sun and they want to tan, right? So why do we tan? Like what's the whole purpose? Just to change color? Well, the cool thing about what causes why we tan and what causes tan lines, it both involves something we just covered. So it covers melanin production. So how do we produce melanin and why do we produce melanin? So what we can do with melanin is that we can, so this is the big reason why we produce melanin. It's this big ball of gas in the center of our solar system that's throwing out radiation everywhere and also throwing it toward our earth. Can you treat vitiligo at all? You know, I should look, I mean, maybe I should try to see what the latest updates are for that. I would have to look up on that. But if there are any treatments, it probably involves immunotherapy, but whether there is any available, I'm not sure about that. Maybe they could take immunosuppressants, but that's a little too powerful. And if you take something that lowers your immune system, that also lowers your defenses against diseases as well. So yeah, it's really tough to treat autoimmune diseases in general. So I'm not sure if there's something out for vitiligo yet, but. I would have to go through the medical literature for that. Okay, back to why we produce melanin. So ultraviolet radiation. So if you've had, I don't know if this one is still allowed in Hawaii because we we ban certain types of um, of, of sunblocks and sunscreens that are harmful to our coral reefs. But if you look at a sunscreen, you might see this special letters, right? So broad spectrum UVA or UVB, or they might just say only UVB, but these the UV part stands for ultraviolet now with the epidermis and dermis again the epidermis the more outer layer the dermis right below the epidermis so with UVA and UV, UVB ratio, or ray, radiation is that UVA actually penetrates deeper past the epidermis but the thing is that U, UVA compared to UVB UVB actually has a little more energy but actually stops short of the dermis so it's pretty much absorbed by the epidermis but what it's saying is that there's actually, just like we have a spectrum of colors from red to violet, ultraviolet is beyond violet. So it also has, we, can, we can't see it with our eyes, like Mr. Peanut probably can because he's a bird. But the thing is that UVA and UVB, these have different radiation, like for what we call wavelengths and frequencies, and they have different energy as well. But what broad spectrum just means that it absorbs both UVA and UVB if you put sunscreen over here on your epidermis. Okay, so why is ultraviolet radiation important? Well, it involves this chemical right here, this molecule. This is DNA, a cartoon version, and what happens is that UV photons, so even though photons don't have mass, they carry energy. And this is like, don't, we don't have to go too much into the physics, but photons have energy. This is why, even if you have infrared light, that's why you have, if you go to a restaurant that has those food under that that red light and keeping it warm, that's the infrared um, radiation. So photons carry energy and energy can break chemical bonds. So if you have all that energy being carried by a photon of UV light hitting the chemical bonds in your DNA, what can that do? That can break these bonds or alter these bonds so it causes mutations. So the key point here is that UV radiation damages chemical bonds and this can damage the DNA in your cells. If that damages your, enough of your DNA and their cells accumulate enough of these mutations, that can lead to cancer. So what we, why do we produce melanin? The cool thing about melanin is that it has, if you've taken any organic chemistry or biochemistry, so all these double bonds are really great for absorbing energy because they have more yeah, so you might, if you take it, with, or actually, don't worry about this if you haven't had old chem. But the thing is that the structure of melanin makes it so that it actually absorbs light very well. And it can actually absorb the photons instead of these photons being going on to damage your nuclear DNA. So it's like melanin takes the hit for DNA and all the other co compounds and chemicals and molecules in your cells. So the cool thing is that melanin structure is very light absorbent and it's able to absorb these UV photons. So that's what the big purpose of melanin is, is that it protects your cells and protects your body against UV radiation. So what we have here is a melanocyte producing melanin. 
But the cool thing is that when melanocytes themselves are hit with UV radiation, what they do is actually increase the amount of melanin they make. So when they make more melanin, what happens? Well, that incre increases the concentration of melanin in the cell. But what does that do to your skin? If your melanocytes are making more melanin in response to UV radiation, that means your skin gets darker. So yeah, the tanning process is a natural response of your body in response to UV radiation. So that's why we get those cool tan, why we get a tan. It's our body protecting ourselves against this UV radiation. So yep, that's why we tan, to absorb more of these UV rays. Now let's go to top hat once again. Next question. Ooh, throw back to chemistry and hint. Think of your macromolecules. So these are all the types of your biological macromolecules. So this molecule over here, 7-dehydrocholesterol. And hint, sterol or cholesterol. What type of molecule is cholesterol? Okay, let's see the responses. Most of you said lipid, and the majority is correct. It is a lipid because classic give giveaway that it's a sterol, it's cholesterol, it has these four rings, those three hexagon and pentagons. So it is a lipid. Now, why am I bringing up this 7 dehydrocholesterol? So it might be like, oh my god, um, melanin is like, or not melanin, UV radiation is really bad, right? But is it always harmful? Well, it also involves this, this is why I bring up that 7-dehydrocholesterol. So it is a steroid, it is a lipid, but the cool thing is that UV light can actually break some of these chemical bonds. And when it breaks this chemical bond right here, and you don't have to know which specific bond, again, this is an organic chemistry class, but what happens is it forms this other compound called cholecalciferol, which is vitamin D3. So by breaking this ring, this is why you can still see some of the original structure of 7-dehydrocholesterol, but with vitamin D3, you notice that this is kind of a broken ring. So this, uh, so this is why UV light can actually be beneficial. It actually is an important way of your skin generating one of the vitamins you need for normal, healthy daily function. So what we have here is that, how is this related? Well, here we have the world, and here, again, not geo geography class, but here's the equator. And where does the sun travel? Well, the sun travels in, the, we, which parts of the world get the most, most uh, exposure to sun and direct sunlight? Well, again, the sun and the equator, this is the part that's uh, in the middle of our axis, or actually like, yeah, our Earth's axis, and what we have here is that the sun, as they're closer to the equator, people living in these areas with, that are closer to the equator, they get more direct sunlight. But people who live closer toward the north and south poles, they get less direct sunlight. Again, not an Earth science class, but here's another cool image showing that kind of phenomenon. So again, this is why people living near here, and we're not exactly at the equator, we're, but pr we're pretty close, definitely closer than the poles. So we get a lot of sunlight, and that's why a lot of people fly to our islands, or they, they like tanning here because they get more sunlight. And this also is related to something called the Fitzpatrick scale. So people living who have um, or genetic origins from areas, geographic areas closer to the equator, they have darker skin tones in general. And why is that? Well, it deals with the level of sunlight, and the levels of sunlight also deals with the levels of UV, UV radiation. So the Fitzpatrick scale is a general way, there's not, I mean, it kind of just categorizes based on not just like the appearance and how fair or how dark your, how much melanin you produce, but also like how, how easily you tan and also how pigmented your skin is and also how often you are 
uh, get sunburn as well. So I, or I actually, I think I'm naturally type four. I tan with ease. That's probably the half Filipino. Like if I, even though I'm, I moved several clicks toward here, superficially. Like I know if I spend more time in the sun, I'm going to get like back to t all the skin again. But what? Why is the scale pretty important? Well, the thing is that if you have more melanin, that absorbs more UV light. So if you have less melanin. That means more UV light gets to your skin, but it also increases the rate of making vitamin D. So, but, so this is the trade-off. If you have a darker skin and more melanin, that absorbs more UVB. So if you have less UV light coming toward your skin and there's deeper layers, people who produce more melanin, they have less vitamin D. And then people, but this is the thing. Remember, melanin is protective, right? So people who have fairer skin and burn easily and don't aren't able to produce melanin in response to UV light, they have increased rates of UV damage and risk of skin cancer because they don't produce as much melanin. And this is the benefit of having a darker skin tone and increased melanin production. You have more protection against UV rays and less risk of skin cancer. Now, does that mean zero risk of skin cancer? No, and actually there's a real cool movement like saying that skin cancers and, and people who have darker skin tones and produce more melanin, we should be looking at that because this might be going undetected because we think, oh yeah, they have a darker skin tone. Maybe they're, more, they're probably more protected against skin cancer. Well, you can still get can, skin cancer, just less of a chance than people who have fairer skin. Yeah, actually, it's funny because like even my <laughs> my dad is like I don't know if he's type one or type two. I mean, even though he's Okinawan, like he if he he doesn't tan, he burns, so he's probably like type two. But yeah, thanks to mom, I have type four. Okay, so that's the trade off. So it's not very, in terms of like UV protection and vitamin D protect production. So again, if you have a darker skin tone and you produce more melanin, you have more UV protection and less risk of skin cancer. But that just means like if you move to somewhere that's like that doesn't get a lot of the sun. So say someone has a really dark skin tone and they move to like Finland or somewhere like Alaska where sometimes they have, don't have any sunlight during the day. Well, this is where you might want to work with your doctor to sometimes if for people who have darker skin tones and they move to a more northern or southern geographic area, they might get additional vitamin D boosters because if they don't get enough sunlight, they might have a lack of vitamin D. But on the other side, we have like the fairer skin tones that don't produce as much melanin. So you have increased vitamin D, and this is another th pro reason why we find people who have ancestry from the poles and the northern and southern areas, they tend to be fairer skin because the, if you have very little light, you want more UV radiation to produce as more, increase your production of vitamin D as well. Okay, so that's what we have there. Okay, so then now let's talk about the dermis and let's see. Type one, yeah, that would actually be cool. I should do a survey. Like, what, where do you fall on the on the Fitzpatrick scale? See the d distribution. But yeah, yeah. So the Fitzpatrick scale is not just about skin, but it's also like whether you burn as well. Again, it's uh, more qualitative. Like you could be somewhere in between, and I would actually talk to a dermatologist about that. Like where you are. But it's kind of good to know, like, okay, especially if you burn easily, that means, like, yeah, you don't, if you don't tan easily, you can keep on <laughs> exposing yourself. But if you're that type one that never tans, then that's kind of counterproductive as well. Yeah. But what we have here, okay, so now the dermis. So the dermis is below the epidermis, and there are two main layers. We have the papillary layer. This is the outer more, uh, the more superficial layer of the dermis. And then you, below that, you have the reticular layer. So the papillary dermis, so papilla refers to, and you see this in anatomy all the time. And I, the anatomy, um, uh, yeah, people who did anatomy and physiology in the back, in the, back in the days, they used the word papilla, which is not Latin for nipples. So they think anything that's raised and slender looks like a nipple. So they think the papillary layer looks like a bunch of nipples. I didn't come up with that. That's the old school anatomist. But this is interesting too. So we have all have fingerprints and someone asked a real cool question about like um, genetics and twins and fingerprints. 
But yeah, what about our fingerprints? Well, the thing is that this papillary layer is very important in our fingerprints. So what if you take this ridge between the papillary layer and the epidermis, and then you kind of just made, and you just took this pattern and repeated it over and over and over again. What you see are all these ridges and valleys and from all the raised, raised bumps of the papilla and also the indentations between each papilla and the papillary layer. So this is where we get our fingerprints and our ridges and valleys is from that papillary layer that's pushing the epidermis and causing those little peaks and also those troughs as well. So let's see. So what we have here is that the dermis is also important in terms of like, okay, it's a connective tissue. This is why we have the cutaneous membrane. So we have the epidermis and the dermis, and this is full of collagen and elastin, so those protein fibers. So it's dense connective tissue because it has a lot of these protein fibers and not too much, or compared to other tissues, it has more protein fibers than it does uh, jelly-like or fluid round substance. So the reticular dermis, so remember that root word reticulum refers to a network or some sort of mesh. So the reticular dermis is made up of a bunch of like collagen fibers and also some elastic fibers. So this is why you can take your skin and stretch it multiple directions. You can pull up, down, and you can put all this, this way and it kind of snaps back. So the way, it, I mean, if it was like only one direction, it would be easy to pull it in some directions and others. Or, and if it didn't have elasticity, it wouldn't slap, snap back. But this is why people, as we age, we notice that sometimes our, the people who are older in age, they, their skin starts to sag. Well, the thing is that if these fibers start to break down, especially the elastic fibers, our skin loses the ability to snap back to its original shape. And yeah, lots of great questions. I think they should be asked in pack pack because we don't have time and I'm trying to get through this, what we have here. Okay, so then the reticular layer. So we have UV radiation and the UVB stops at the epidermis and where of the epidermis and dermis, but the UVA, this can actually penetrate deeper into your dermis. And what happens when it enters the reticular layer where you have all these proteins, these, um, this, the collagen and elastin and other reticular fibers? So what if you're constantly bombarding, like say someone goes to the beach too often and or if they use tanning beds for whatever reason, even though we live in Hawaii, and they expose this, their skin and integument to all this UV radiation. So what happens to reticular layer? Well, yeah, so I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so the co so I was like, what, are, what does she look like now? I just typed into Google, okay, where is, this is like a crazy show called My Strange Addiction. Like, where is she now? Now, and yeah, in the previous stuff, she said like she tanned so much, she started bleeding. So she was really damaging her skin uh, incredibly. Uh, so this episode was back in 2011, and she said what she was 20 at the time of filming. So the cool thing is, I, and what we have here is that, oh, Instagram. So I looked at her Instagram, and this is her, and oh, she has a boyfriend now. But I think this is the same girl because I'm there's an, I I had a hard time comparing it, but I found this image, and yeah, it looks like same eye shape, and she has the same nose and mouth. So this is like was posted this year. So this is ten years later. So now she's thirty. So she's thirty, and look at this. And I mean, I'm, it looks like she stopped doing that ridiculous tanning. She looks. Like she's no longer doing baking herself anymore but yeah look at this i mean the skin around your eyelids very very thin not much fat i mean you have some muscle supporting it but if you have very very thin skin on your eyelids and you're bombarding it with uv radiation and also in that episode she says she doesn't use goggles because she doesn't want to look like a raccoon so her eyelids got the brunt of it, and that's why our eyelids are one of the first things to age because the skin is really thin. She is 30 years old. So again, then that dermatologist was put, and if you ever been to a dermatologist, they, they, they zoom in on that. They know the signs of aging. Like, like when I went to a dermatologist for her skin cancer uh, checkup once, he's like, oh yeah, I see this spot, spot. So I'm like, oh my God, stop it. This is like, don't, don't do that to already. But yeah, she's 30 years old, so even though thankfully it looks like she stopped doing that crazy tanning, yeah, the damage is there as you can see here.
So that maybe that would what Sam would look like if she continued down that path of tanning. So yeah, that's the infamous tanning mom. So you might have seen this on some beaches. Like you have people. I think this is it. Darantella or Versace. But yeah, like people who don't apply sunscreen and they tan. I mean, wow. It's like why do they look like that when they tan and continue to tan like that? Like, luckily for Sam, I mean, it looks like it just hit her eyelids, but oh man, what about the rest of your body? So this is what we call, this is what's happening. You're damaging the dermis, you're causing all this UV damage. So what happens with the UV photons? Well, we know they can damage DNA, but here's a molecule of collagen. And if you have some uh, lab to go to, I know it's over time, but let's do a quick top hat question. I know it's like, and I know it's that six year old, oh my god, that breaks my heart. So here's collagen. So what if you hit collagen with UV radiation? What do you think happens? Really quick question. So quick question. Is collagen made up of chemical bonds? Oh, I've never seen, I haven't seen that Spongebob episode. I should look that up. But yeah, that part about her bringing her six-year-old daughter to this, I would, I would bring her to court too. That's abuse. Poor daughter. Like, You don't want her getting damaged that young. My God. It's like, oh. And study guide for a test. So there will be one released by this weekend. So plan on re releasing the study guide so you can study over the weekend and this week. But I have to look up that SpongeBob episode. <laughs> okay, let's see what people said. So most of you said yes, and most of you are correct. Collagen is a molecule. It is made out of chemical bonds. And again, we're made out of atoms, we're made out of chemicals, we're made out of molecules. So collagen is a polypeptide, and what it does is that it wraps around itself, and then it forms these long fibrils. So collagen, elastin, they're all peptides, they're all made of chemical bonds. So what happens is that UV radiation, again, it damages the chemical bonds in DNA. It also can damage the chem, in the terms of like 7-D hydrocholesterol, that's a good example of where it's actually beneficial to break bonds. But photons carry energy, chemical bonds are energy, this energy from photons can break chemical bonds. So if you bombard collagen with all these UV photons, this can break up part collagen. If you break up the part the collagen in your skin, it's going to lose that volume from collagen, it's going to lose the elasticity by damaging all the elastic fibers. So this is why those people look like that. They bombard their skin and their collagen and the dense irregular connective tissue with so much UV rays that it obliterated all those protein fibers. So again, even though the protein fibers aren't cells themselves, they are made by cells and they can get damaged. So this is why we age our skin ages. If the damage outpaces our skin's ability to repair itself, then that's going to break down our skin. And that's why you saw that really, really crepe paper thin skin we saw on like the those people's bodies and also in the eyelids for or um, poor Sam were there. Like she said, <laughs> I mean, that was her when she was 20. She didn't, oh, you can inject Botox, but that Botox ain't gonna help those eyelids. And you can't, I'm pretty sure like, those are so thin, you can't inject filler there. So that's why she, that, her eyelids probably looked like that. So yeah, this is why our skin ages. As we age, this is natural. Even if we stay out of the, out of the sun, our body's ability to repair itself kind of outpaces the damage we get as we age. And as we start aging and losing fibroblasts and the ability to repair our dermis, this is why we have start to form wrinkles. So by having less of this dermal layer and, and this particular layer and all the protein fibers, we start to lose the elasticity and turgor of our skin. So yeah. And to end with this, like in terms of repair, so what we have is scarification. I think it's kind of fall out of favor, but I'm like, wow, like impressive work, but not for me. <laughs> but something, what causes scarring? So the interesting thing is that this reticular dermis, this is where you find a lot of fibroblasts. 
So what we have in the particular layer is like, what if you do this like, hopefully with a clean instrument, put a deep cut that goes to the reticular layer. Well, it also cuts a lot of the fibers and it's definitely ouchy, right? It's gonna hit all those nerves, but it also stimulates those fibroblasts and the, to generate more protein fibers. So as these fibroblasts start to deposit more collagen, what happens is that it kind of forms these like harder structures that kind of push up the rest of the skin above that. So this is why we get these raised scars. It's due to all the fibroblasts doing their thing, repairing it, depositing a lot of collagen, but those deposits of collagen, they push the under the skin that's above it up. So this is why we get those scarification.